thank you. Thank you for, uh, you know, coming in and chatting with me today. I, I appreciate yeah, happy it. Happy to do it. Yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I, I was really kind of interested in, in chatting with you because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big, I've been a big Beatles fan for, for a long time and, uh, actually had an opportunity to go out and, um, Actually, I went out for, for a summer uh, with the John Lennon educational bus. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a. Uh, no, it's, no, I'm, I'm not. Re- I've heard that. I don't really know anything about it. But why don't you tell me? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it was. Uh, so I was I was working uh, with a with a with a company with a, a college, actually. And uh, they were affiliated with the John Lennon educational bus. And I guess it's an organization that's probably ran by uh, Yoko, I think. And, uh, but it's basically a bus that they've modified, turned it into a rolling sound studio and they go out and they have engineers basically live on the bus and travel around the country and teach uh, kids how to, how to do sound engineering and things like that. So um, that was kind of, you know, exciting for me at the time. Um, this was a long time ago you're talking about? This was uh, probably two mid to late 2000s. Oh, okay. Yeah. But like in the past 10 years, in other words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's still, I think it's still a thing. I think they still do it. But uh, yeah, so that was, that was about as, as close as I've, I've ever had it connected. So when I, I saw about your book where you had actually been able to like, you know, kind of, you know, you imagine someone's diaries are kind of an, an inner sanctum of their thoughts and <laughs> what they're probably not sharing with everyone else. Although I'm sure people do kind of self edit uh, at times. You know, I I really wanted to kind of chat with you and because it's a little bit more of a of a first, not really a first person, but uh, a little closer to the source, I guess you could say. So I I I, I kind of wanted to ask too, like, uh, you know, how did you start out on on that journey with, uh, you know, to to write this book about about John Lennon and, uh, you know, were you already a fan of the Beatles or did you, uh, you know, just kind of stumble into the situation where you had this opportunity with with the diaries? Well, yes, I was a fan of the Beatles. I was a fan since 1964 when you know like uh a few billion other people i saw them on the ed sullivan show and uh, i was just really for a long time nothing more than uh a beatles fan i wasn't like totally fanatical yeah they were a group whose music i very much appreciated for a long time and what happened was how I became involved in the thing with the diaries and got really close to it was that in college, I met this guy, Fred Seaman. Um, I was the editor of the college paper, Observation Post, it was called. This was around 1973, 1974. And Fred joined um, the Observation Post. We became friendly and uh, I found out that his family was involved with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Um, His aunt was Sean's governess after Sean was born in 1975. And his uncle had produced Yoko's performance pieces at Carnegie Hall. And uh, when Fred graduated from college, his first job out of college, John and Yoko hired him to be their assistant. And this was 1979 now. And and Fred came to me in 1979. I was his editor, like I said, on the college paper. He liked my writing. And he said that he was going to write a book about John that, you know, he'd been hearing a, about John and Yoko from his aunt and his and his uncle for a long time. And he felt it was a family obligation to write the book. Now, the whole time he was employed by John, which was from February 79 until John was killed in December 1980. He was, tra- you know, he was traveling with them. Uh, he was in the Dakota every day, you know, doing whatever John told him to do. 
running errands when John was recording the the demo tape for the album that became uh, Double Fantasy. Fred was in Bermuda with John when that was going on, and he you know helped John with the recording. He even played percussion on one of the songs, and the whole time that this was going on for like two years, you know, all in 1979 and all of uh, 1980, Fred was, was telling me every day what was going on. I was, I was taking notes when, you know, he was traveling, he'd call me, he'd tell me about it. Um, I would be in contact with Fred a couple of times per week. And I was just, I was taking notes on all the stuff he was he was telling me he was taking notes too. In December eighth, nineteen eighty, John was killed. He was murdered. He was assassinated. And a few days after that, Fred came to me and he said, "Now is the time to start doing the book." And I was basing the book. You know, I was kind of debriefing him and I was going through Fred's journals, which you know, he was keeping to in May 1981. This is like five, six months after the murder. He comes to me and he had John's diaries, the, the diaries that John had been keeping from 1975 till the day he died. And you know, it was clear that this was the key to the project. Fred had told me that when he was in Bermuda with John, that John told him that he had a premonition of his death and that if something should happen to him, John, that it was Fred's job to tell the true story of his final days and to avail himself of whatever research material he needed to tell the story. And uh, he gave me the diaries. And over a period of many months that that followed, I transcribed the diaries. And uh, that was how the thing came about. And there's more to it. That at a certain point, this was 19, late 1981, early 1982, I'd been working hard. I had been, you know, pretty much holed up in my apartment, transcribing the diaries, writing the book, going through tapes and just like all kinds of material that Fred was feeding me. Uh, he said I'd been working hard and that I should take a vacation. Um, I took a vacation. <laughs> I went to Jamaica and then to Bermuda to do more research for the book. When I was gone, Fred ransacked my apartment, took everything I'd been working on, and I came back. I saw what happened. I was in a state of shock. What I realized after being in a state of shock for about two weeks was that I had portions of the diary memorized, and I began writing down everything I could remember from the diaries. And... That was how over a period of 18 years until the book was finally published that I told the inside story of John Lennon's final years based on what I had read in his his diaries. And that's uh, in a nutshell what happened. So if I understand it right, it's it's sort of it is based on the uh, the diaries, but it's somewhat stylized or fic or possibly fiction there is some fiction mixed in with it is is this am i reading that right yeah that for copyright reasons i couldn't just quote from the diaries so i used the diaries as a way to put together the story fragment by f by f by fragment based on what i knew to be true from the diaries and there was, you know, all this information out there. Um, it came from various places. It came from other people's books. And over that period of 18 years, by doing research, um, by speaking to people 
who were involved with John. I was able to put together the story by just piecing, to, piecing together other, 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 the fragments. And um, there were parts, if I couldn't find it in some other source, and I only knew about it from the diaries, then I used what I call a fictional technique to fill in the missing pieces. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that maybe 10 to 15 percent of the book is um, is based on this fictional technique. And uh, the book, by the way, is called Nowhere Man, The Final Days of John Lennon. Uh, it's available in in a paperback from Quick American Archives, it's available as an ebook, and it's uh, it's been translated into various languages. And you know, the book has been out there for you know now for twenty one years, and uh, it's an established classic. And you know, the book for me, when it was finally published after eighteen years of people saying no, it finally came out in two thousand. I had been working on it on and off since like 1982, 1983. Um, you know, when it, f- it finally came out, it became a bestseller. And, you know, it's just endured for all these years. And, you know, people realize that it is the most accurate record available now of uh, John's consciousness over the years that he dropped out of the public eye. Yeah. So, so like, so like the stories about him like getting doing doing the feet washing and uh when he was overseas and uh as, as well as visiting the 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 massage parlors those those things are are then mostly mostly true then well it, or or were pulled from he said the feet washing right yeah yeah all right that is the first chapter of the book that I call um, code of fantasy. No, 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 Jerusalem fantasy. Right. And what that was is using the fictional technique mm. to begin the book, but it's my fantasy of John's fantasy. And I used it as a quick way to establish the character. And also there were legal issues sure. that, you know, I wanted to make it clear that I was not quoting from the diaries or like, you know, taking anything that would be a violation of the copyright of the Lenin estate. And uh, the first chapter, aside from establishing John's character, it was a way just to not have the lawyers on my back. And, you know, when you're involved in this kind of thing, especially with Yoko Ono, that there's always lawyers lurking, you know, trying to stop people from publishing anything that has not been been um, approved by the yeah. estate. And, uh, you know, this was not approved. Gotcha. Yeah, no, she a bit of a reputation to be a little litigious for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, to say the least. Is is this one of the is this the main reason it just took so long to get it out there and to get it published the eighteen years? Yeah, that publishers, you know, publishers mm-hmm. are under the impression that Ono sues everybody who tries to write a, a book about John and Yoko. Uh, the truth is that Yoko only threatens to sue, mm. and <laughs> she has never actually sued a writer for something oh, wow. they've written, but any unauthorized book, the writer and the publisher have been met by threats, you know, by legal threats. And uh, I did get threatened, but, you know, nothing happened. And, you know, yeah. like I say, the book's been out there now for 21 years. So, you know, it's, it's, I've always heard this this joke when I was growing up. I always heard that, well, you know, Yoko's to blame for the Beatles breaking up. <laughs> and, you know, I, I kind of do like 
what what was the origin of her of 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 John and Yoko meeting each other and because it's such a I don't want to say it's a strange relationship but it's a little strange uh as you really continue on in the book and you and and just your book as well as you know just knowing what I know from from other facets as well it's just a really strange relationship uh, you know I, I it seems very very odd their their relationship dynamics yeah well they met in the 1960s when john was still married to his first wife it was cynthia lennon and um yoko was having an art exhibition at uh, a gallery in london john was invited to the exhibition he went uh, he liked her that's art right. and that's how they met. And, uh, you know, he soon, uh, you know, left his wife for Yoko Ono. I believe they got married. You know, he, you know, John got divorced. Um, John and Yoko got married in 1968. You know, the Beatles went on for, um, a couple of more years after that. I, you know, they finally broke up for real in 1970, um, the thing about, you know, Yoko breaking up the Beatles, yeah, I, mean, I don't think that's really true. I think that, you know, Lennon was just, he'd had enough and, you know, he was ready to move on to, uh, a new phase of his life. And, you know, instead of collaborating with Paul McCartney, he was collaborating with Yoko Ono and, uh, you know, he was just ready to do that. He was sick of the Beatles. He yeah. had had enough. So, uh, you know, to blame Yoko for that, I don't think is really fair. Um, and, you know, he never wanted to look back, John, that the idea of a, a Beatles reunion, which apparently McCartney wanted, uh, John, you know, just based on what I saw in the diaries, John was repulsed by the idea of a, a, a Beatles reunion. You know, he did not want to move backward. Uh, he wanted to move forward. And, you know, as you mentioned, the strangeness of their relationship. Yoko was very much into doing business, to negotiating, that kind of thing. Mm. John despised the business aspect of, you know, dealing with Apple records and the, and the, the, um, the music business as a whole. And he was just happy to hand, you know, all that over to Yoko, you know, let her deal with Apple, but he, you know, her deal with the accountants and the lawyers, he wanted no part of it. And, you know, he turned the whole financial aspect of his life over to Yoko. Yeah, it's 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 that's that's kind of one of the things that I found very interesting and you kind of touched on it. You know, it's it's very obvious in the book that he is over the Beatles and and he, you know, you know, despite all the success that that Paul kept having after the Beatles, you know, he he didn't want anything to do with it. And it was like he was searching for something but could never quite find what it was that was going to be the next thing for many years. And I would almost say, you know, kind of fell into, obviously, you know, I guess there was some, some, some drug use, but, you know, I would even say the bigger issue may have just simply been this uh, trying to feel, fill or search for that need through uh, materialism um, was something that seemed like that was something that always, made them feel better. They would go spend a lot of money on something and feel better for a, a little bit of time. But, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. It was like, he just couldn't, couldn't really find what he wanted, uh, after the Beatles, even though he was really over it at that point. Yeah, John was a great searcher and the main thing he was searching for was a way to stop the pain, the primal pain that he felt going back to uh, his mother dying, his father leaving him, you know, all that stuff that goes back to when he was like four or five years old. And, you know, he just always felt this pain. He always felt this, this, this emptiness. And he tried to fill it with all these different things, with money, with fame, with uh, drugs, you know, 
the LSD, the primal screaming, uh, and Yoko Ono, that, you know, these were all ways that John tried to stop the pain. And um, none of it worked. You know, some of it seemed to work a little while, but, you know, for the most part, the pain, you know, always returned, the emptiness always returned. And yeah, he expressed that very clearly in his, his music, in his journals. Um, you know, that another thing that Yoko got him into, which I'm sure you know now from reading the book, is all this occult stuff yeah. that, you know, there was numerology, yeah. very big on numerology and the number nine. There was tarot. He had um, a full time tarot card reader. This guy, his real name was John Green. They called was him Charlie nice. Swan. That he that was, was that was oh the oracle right or right yes oh, yeah. the oracle yes that's how John referred to him in the diaries as <laughs> the O. and there was you know there was magic that Yoko went to Colombia the country to pay a Colombian bruja Lena to to teach her how to catch how to cast uh, magic spells and the thing about magic is. Magic works if you believe that magic works. For, you know, if you think that this wealthy, powerful woman put a spell on you, that <laughs> you know you're going to be affected right. by it. And you know they would consult with Charlie Swan, and they would do the magic spells. You know, every time that they were negotiating contracts or hiring people or doing you know any kind of business that, you know, they would just, you know, run the numbers and run the cards and, uh, you know, uh, run the astrology. And, you know, they would just base all their decisions on these things, these occult things. They would not make a move without first running it by Charlie Swan. This kind of this kind of thought process and decision making absolutely terrifies me <laughs> to make your life decisions off of it, because I would even say, you know, that it, at one point in the book, when I was reading, I was thinking about this, this, these, these aspects, and it was that by using these to guide their decisions, they were almost, and especially maybe John more more than Yoko, were be, were making themselves their own prisoners in in a way because it, it limited what they could do when they wanted to do it, and it felt like it might have even contributed to his frustration and, and some of his unhappiness at times, which is is just interesting because they used it for, like you said, literally almost all their decisions it, it is is sort of the way it came, came across. They really, really leaned on it a lot. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, the idea of John as prisoner, yeah, yeah he was a, a prisoner in a gilded cage that he was a prisoner of his fame. He was a mm. prisoner of his wealth. And yeah, he was a prisoner of his occult beliefs. Um, and that when you're as famous and recognizable as John Lennon, uh, you know, just walking out in the street is an adventure. And, uh, you know, he had to be careful. Uh, and, you know, eventually, you know, it was his fame and his wealth and, you know, that attracted Mark David Chapman because, you know, he saw the man, you know, singing Imagine No Possessions as, you know, being the ultimate hypocrite. The man who sang that had, you know, every possession that anybody could possibly want. Right. You know, that was the other thing that he used to try to kill the pain was just, you know, to fill it with material objects with like, you know, houses and beautiful clothing and uh, traveling and Mercedes Benzes and whatnot that, you know, it was just all the constant search to stop the pain and fill the emptiness. Yeah. I, I it's, 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 even even thinking back to the difference in time and the value of money at the time, it's still impressive the numbers that they would go out on spending sprees 
to, to just buy clothes, if nothing else. Uh, the Bermuda trip, I'm, I'm thinking of two days down in Bermuda for, for on her trip, on Yoko's trip down there. And I think it was $17,000 just in a couple hours, you know, was it w- was gone. But do you, th- I mean, I, I don't know much about really, to, to be honest, about how their business went during this time, but would, is it, would it be fair to say, or or how how did using these occult beliefs affect their business? Do you, it, I mean, did it inhibit it? Do you think, or 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 did it come across that way in his writings, or did it seem like you know things were progressing well? Because there's like there's also this conflict where like, and I don't I don't fully understand, and maybe you have insight into this, like what his he seems very petty. Lynn, John does. He seems very a little petty towards, especially towards Paul, but towards other people that are having success at the moment when he's frustrated. And you know that's that's human nature, I suppose. But I think it's also another level when when you've uh, got a, a wife that's literally trying to cast spells on people <laughs> or curse them. Um, it, it, you know, it kind of takes it a, a, to, a little bit to the next step beyond just the, the frustration that we all feel in those situations. Well, you know, that Charlie Swan was their main occult guide and he was an intelligent, insightful guy. And, you know, he would give them business advice based on the tarot cards And they'd run the numbers and so forth. And they made a lot of money. I mean, (laughs) that, you know, was it the occult and the cards and the numbers and the astrology that was, you know, helping them make money? Or, you know, would they have made money without all that? Uh, I'm sure they would have, you know, made money without all the occult. But I guess it just. I think that, you know, Yoko used all the occult stuff that, you know, before she's going to be before she'll meet with you. She wants to know your birthday and your astrological sign that she just used that to keep people off balance. And Mm -hmm. um, it was effective. That's a good tactic. But, (laughs) you know, that. She was apparently a pretty good businesswoman, a a tough negotiator. I mean, the bottom line is they made a lot of money. They kept making a lot of money. They were, you know, multimillionaires. They had hundreds of millions of dollars. I would not be surprised if uh, at the moment, you know, that number is a billion dollars. For sure. I mean, you know, just the way the, the, uh, the, the, the stock market's been going the past 10 years that you know, I'm sure that her wealth at this point is almost inconceivable yeah. to, uh, you know, a person who's not a billionaire. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. me. Yeah, yeah for sure. Like you. I don't think you're a billionaire. Not not, not even close. <laughs> nah. Yeah, I think you could make the argument that she's, and I don't, I don't know many people that would disagree that she's very good in business. And, and, and. One one thing that kind of no matter where I've I've read about their relationship and the Beatles and her, their careers and and Yoko. One thing that always seems to come across is that she is a better business person that or I shouldn't frame it that way, but it comes across to me that she's possibly a better business person than she ever was a a musician or an artist. And in some ways, I don't know when I'm reading the, when I'm reading, when I was reading the book, I had the thought that because I've seen this with other, other individuals that are, you know, you're kind of a, a professional in this industry but you find someone that's more successful and more talented than you in the industry because you know you really can't make it as far as they have and you kind of just lynch on and it, it it that thought did cross my mind as i was reading through the book and but you know like you said as as a business person she's more i think than proved you know her her value and worth and skill well you know yoko as far as a recording artist she's able to hire 
the best people to work with her. And, you know, they're able to raise her to a higher level that in general, her music is not my cup of tea. Uh, there are some songs that I do like, you know, but for the most part, I don't like it. I think, you know, some of her art is clever and, and whimsical, but, you know, for the most part, again, it's, you know, not something that really uh, appeals to me. Um, I mean, she's never had like commercial big commercial success. Has she ever had a big commercial success hit or anything with the music? Yeah. She's had like, you know, what do they call it? Like, um, uh, studio hits, you know, that they played in, in dance clubs, you know, dance mm, hits, but gotcha. you know, it's not like you're going to well, turn on, <laughs> uh, you know, the radio and they're going to play Yoko Ono though, you know, occasionally, you know, some station like, you know, here in New York, WFUV, you might occasionally, you know, hear something a couple of times per year. If, you know, they're doing a thing about the Beatles or, or John Lennon, they might play uh, a Yoko song. And, you know, right. one or two uh, songs on the Double Fantasy album are passable that, you know, they don't like repulse me and like, you know, make me want to turn off the speaker. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, it's just, you know, it's not widely popular commercial stuff. You know, yeah. it's not widely popular commercial music. And uh, I think avant garde would be arouse good. hate in me like it does some other people. And, you know, I know <laughs> like an artist who, uh, you know, goes into her studio and she paints while she's listening to uh, a Yoko Ono album, you know, fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, the thing about Yoko is that a lot of people do feel that she broke up the up the Beatles and they can't forgive her for that. And, um, you know, she just, she has a knack for inspiring hatred among a lot of people. And it's unfortunate for her. Yeah. I don't, I don't think she gets enough credit. It's one of the reasons why I was, you know, so excited to, to, to be, with, uh, you know, as affiliated and, and went out with the bus, uh, the John Lennon bus that summer, you know, is because of, to me, the whole imagine and just the, the message that his legacy has sort of developed into has been, to me, very uplifting and inspirational. And <laughs> certainly in this day and time, we, you know, any message that helps people come together and have a conversation and, and uh, ig ignore our differences and find common ground, I think is certainly a, a good thing. And so uh, in that in that respect, I think certain, certainly she's done wonders for uh, culture, you know, in a cultural and societal level in, in that way. Yeah, well, she's an an advocate for peace. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's wonderful, but you know, the whole thing of, uh, imagine peace, uh, does she really believe that, you know, has that worked, you know, has like, you know, all the world imagining peace brought any peace. Uh, I just think that there's that if she really was serious, I'm sure she wants peace in the world, you know, who doesn't? Well, you know, I'm sure there's people who don't. You know, <laughs> Somebody doesn't. <laughs> peace in the world. That, I'm sure she would like peace, but, uh, you know, if she really wanted to do something to bring about peace, there are better ways to go about that uh, than saying, imagine peace. I mean, you know, I've, I've tried right. that. It doesn't seem to work that, you know, she, you know, she should take her billion dollars and maybe, uh, you know, fund a school where, you know, like the Koch brothers do like, you know, they, you know, they give money to colleges and, um, you know, in these colleges, they teach the kind of politics, you know, how to bring about the kind of politics, the polluting politics yeah. and the capitalist politics that the Koch brothers want that, you know, she should fund educational institutes that would teach people how to bring about peace, you know, through the, you know, through politics and diplomacy. And, you know, I don't know, you know, that I'm not a politician that, but, 
you know, there's more to bringing about peace than imagining peace as nice as, nice as that might sound and, uh, you know, as good as that song might be. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. And I, I, would, I would even say that the main culprit there is probably the money because that seems to drive the incentive for everybody to do the things they shouldn't uh, that, that cause us not to have peace is, is chasing the money uh, most of the time. Um, let's circle back though on this, this Oracle guy. He's such a weird, a weird, an interesting person. Like what was his background before he, before he came onto the scene with the linens and what was, he just, I mean, was he legit as uh, considered legit as, as, a uh, as a, as an oracle? <laughs> uh, he was a professional tarot card reader. You know, I don't know what he was doing before he started reading tarot cards professionally. I don't know how he learned to, to you know, to do this. Yeah, he was clearly, you know, uh, he was an imposing guy. He was like six foot six. Oh, and, wow. you know, Just huge. And uh, yeah, he was a smart insightful guy who knew a lot about a lot of things. And, you know, my understanding of the way that tarot cards work is that you just kind of look at the pictures on the cards and the person who you're doing the reading for, and you kind of riff in, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like being a psychiatrist or a psychologist. You just kind of, you know, riff on what you know about the person that you're doing the reading for and like, you know, what the cards are showing. And I think you could really make, you know, any card mean anything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I would agree with that. I would agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I can't say that I'm a, I'm a believer myself, but uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I just find it fascinating people that are, um, that usually find themselves in those positions of, you know, oracles or tarot readers or clairvoyants or mediums or anything. I, I usually find the common thing is that they're very charismatic, which is a is a very uh, powerful tool to be able to uh, do that professionally. I think is probably a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, you know that sounds right. It, you know, it does seem clear that um, you know Charlie Swan, John Green had charisma. And, um, you know, he had, you know, he had that insight and you know, he was just, you know, able to put it together to pull off this career that kind of strikes me as a scam that <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not going to hire a tarot card reader, even if I could afford it. I just, no, I don't <laughs> believe it. But, you know, and I, I think they just found him, you know, entertaining and good mm. company and he gave them good business advice that they believed or you know maybe yoko well yeah they both believed it they believed in charlie swan and uh you know he pulled off this uh this thing and if he hadn't given them good business advice uh it wouldn't have worked and but you know ultimately he missed the really big december 8th prediction you know he didn't see that in the cars yeah. Um, and, you know, there were things that could have been done to prevent that, that, you know, the security, there was like basically little to no security. And, uh, you know, I don't know why he didn't advise them to get more security. I mean, you know, that seems like it would have been some pretty solid advice, but he didn't do that. And, you know, after December 8th, he kind of faded from the picture. Yeah, it doesn't seem like you would have needed to be a uh, a clairvoyant or uh, a, or have any special powers to 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 know that uh, safety is is a big concern, especially in 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 those well in any time for somebody like Lennon, especially if you just wanted to walk out and go go amongst the people, um, you, you know you you do have to be very careful about those things. Um, one of the one of the things that struck me as well was what was I, I mean I know he was that that John was over the Beatles but 
what was his particular like beef with with Paul? Like, you know, he doesn't really. I mean, it. He kind of talks about how the negotiations between the whole Beatles enterprise, you know, were always very volatile. But it seems like he really kind of fixed a fixed on 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 Paul for some reason. Is yeah. It- well, you know, he was really close to Paul. Paul was his main creative partner in the Beatles. I mean, between the two of them, they put together this incredible catalog, which is comparable to like, you know, Cole Porter or the Gershwins or uh, uh, you know, people like that. You know, they just they put together this amazing music that's like the soundtrack to the 20th century, the latter part of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, they were, you know, Paul was extremely talented. He was, you know, he was John's creative partner, uh, his, his rival, uh, his fellow Beatle. They were the driving force behind the Beatles. And when the Beatles broke up, I mean, you know, there was just, all the nastiness with uh, the breakup and the money and, you know, everybody feeling everybody's ripping them off. And, and what, that, what, what caused, what caused the breakup? What, what really caused the breakup? I think the breakup, I think Paul wanted the, the Beatles to continue. And I think that John was just sick of it. Mm. He wanted out. He wanted to, you know, go off with Yoko and collaborate with her. And uh, you know, that was pretty much the end of it. Mm. And you know, what I was going to, you know, that when the Beatles uh, broke up, you know, John did a few, so- a few solo albums. He had some hits, you know, like Imagine for sure. And uh, uh, he did one, his first solo album, Plastic Ono Band. Uh, I think that is right. a great album that's. It stands up after, you know, all these years it came out, I think, 1970, 1971. And that is just like, you know, a strong album, cut after cut. Um, but, you know, he didn't really have a lot of hits. You know, Imagine was a hit, uh, uh, whatever gets you through the night. The one with uh, um, uh, with Elton John, Instant Karma. You know, there were a handful of, of, um, of hits. But when John went into seclusion after Sean was born and he was basically doing nothing musical or nothing publicly musical for five years. And Paul was just like, you know, putting out hit after hit. um, It made him jealous, you know, Mm -hmm. that it made him jealous when he thought that Paul and Linda had a happier marriage than him (laughs) and Yoko, that pretty much everything Paul did made him jealous. And, you know, he was just obsessed with Paul at the beginning of 1980, before he decided to come out of seclusion and do the uh, the uh, double fantasy album that at the beginning of the year, January, February, uh, there was just nothing happening. And Paul was about to begin his tour of Japan with Wings. And John's happiest moment at the beginning of the year was when Paul was caught, (laughs) was arrested going through customs in Japan for marijuana. And, you know, the tour was ruined. Paul went to jail for like 10 days. And John really believed that Yoko put a spell on Paul and brought the thing about. (laughs) And, you know, that there was just this explosion of joy in John's journal when he got the news that Paul was busted. But they were, but they were, they weren't, they were more than, than just collaborative partners. They were like friends, like oh, yeah, back in absolutely. the day, you know, they were it's, like brothers. Yeah. It's so weird that, that, I mean, I guess there's so many examples of this throughout time of just business, you know, causing that, uh, re- those relationships to break down. But uh, yeah, just, Interesting seeing how that, you know, sort of sort of evolved and uh, yeah, just kind of of interesting. There was one very telling remark in John's journal about Paul that I mentioned in the book. And that was, I love Paul, but I don't like him. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a sentiment many people can feel about somebody in their life. Oh, yeah. 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 Like their spouse. Yeah. You you mentioned, you know, that that uh, that there there was there should have been, you know, additional security there towards the end, you know, that could have maybe been been a preventative measure or something could have been done to be, pre- you know, be more preventative of of how things went down in in the very end what were i mean what were some of the indications do you think that they should have been a, aware of i mean it at that time it, is it just something that they should have just always paid more attention to or is it was there something specific about that time that you think stood out that that should have made them be more cautious no i don't think that there was one thing that stood out in particular but you know you're talking about a guy who spent the f- for five years, he was just, you know, out of the public eye for the most part that, you know, there were these people hanging around in front of the Dakota who would like, you know, wait for him and see him. And he was still recognizable in the street, but he was basically out of the public eye for, you know, for five years. And somehow when this was happening, it just aroused people's curiosity and he became more famous by just kind of hiding by becoming invisible and then he goes out in public he's making music for the first time in in five years it's just like all over the media that like you know suddenly there was just all this attention focused on him and it just you know that it it just seems to me that as a routine precaution, because there was so much attention that was focused on him and everybody knew where John lived and where he was going. And there were just like always people there. So, you know, as a, a matter of prudence, of as a matter of just like basic common sense, there should have been more security. But what happened to him, what Mark David Chapman did, when he shot John, that was something completely different, new and unheard of, that this was the, f- the, f- the first time that, you know, not a politician was ass- assassinated, but an entertainer that an entertainer had never been ass- ass- assassinated in that way like a politician. And it, it was comparable to what happened to Kennedy, to what happened to, you know, John and Robert Kennedy, that, you know, those three ass- assassinations are just like really three of a kind. The only difference is, you know, two of them were actual politicians and one was a beetle. And, uh, you know, John too was a politician, you know, a lot of his song, you know, Imagine is a political song in its way. Yeah, you uh, you almost think the progression for him would have been to become more politically active in his life uh, if he would have you know been able to 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 live it out longer. It, it seems like that was maybe a direction he was heading because he he really was a, very much seemed over the partying over all of that most of the time. It's very clear in the book, like most of the time he just wants to sit sit at home or you know, not, not, you know, kind of be to himself or, you know, he was really over all of the parting, except once in a while he would like, he, it seemed like he really enjoyed still going out and, and being recognized or noticed, uh, even during the time of his seclusion, you know, it was like once in a while he'd go out and somebody would recognize him and it would give him that little bit of, uh, you know, just, uh, boost boost of 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 happiness or or whatever he it was that he he didn't normally seem to have um yeah right yeah i mean what's the point of going to all that trouble to become incredibly famous if you're not going to occasionally enjoy you know being recognized and signing somebody's record album well some people would say that uh, that you uh being famous is a byproduct uh of of following your passion of something that you're extremely talented at. Uh, I hope that people don't pursue, pursue things for the fame, although I know people do, but I I think that's the, I hope that I don't, I think that's the wrong approach. I think you get better. 
I think you get better outcomes as well as better uh, better art when it's done for the true passion as opposed to the glory, so to speak. Yeah, well, there, I don't think there's any question that you know, that John wanted the fame, he wanted the money. Um, you know, he thought that the fame and the money, like I was saying before, would stop the pain, would, would fill the hole that was at the, the center of his being. But, you know, what the fame, well, especially the fame, what the fame did was it just kind of exacerbated his feelings of, you know, insecurity and you know, emptiness and so forth. And it just like, you know, all the things that were bad, that were, that were, uh, were psychologically a problem that they just became more intensified. Right. Right. And it just, you know, it just brought everything to, the, brought everything to the surface. Yeah, you could you could you could see him he see him searching for it in so many different ways, you know, from his two weeks of uh finding finding God to uh you know meditation oh, yeah, yeah. to to meditation to uh you know <laughs> you know just sitting sitting in bed with the cats uh, he, you know, he went through so many different little cycles or periods where he was, you know, moving from this to that and even even you know the you know his it's interesting because <laughs> he gets very he gets very kind of off put when when he suspects that Yoko might be having an affair on, <laughs> on him but yet at the same time he was going to these massage parlors to get jerked off basically <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is kind of kind of interesting you know yeah well yeah he he did that once that you know that's something that the other biographers have not written about that. There are a couple of books that mention he took a trip to, to South Africa, but they don't really say what he did there. And, you know, what he did there was he went to massage parlors a, a couple of times. And as far as I know, that was the only time he did that. But, you know, he, um, he had a passion for May Pang who, when he left Yoko at one point in the early 1970s, or you know, like 1973, 1974, that you know he ran off with May Pang, and uh, you know, till his dying day, he carried a torch for May Pang, and like I said in the book, that May was fun, May was was pleasure, Yoko though was survival, and he just chose survival over pleasure and you know yoko was also the mother of his child but what does that mean you know what does that mean that that yoko was survival and and the other was you know fun and pleasure i mean it shouldn't a relationship i mean what 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 do you mean by that that yoko was survival i mean that yoko kept the world at bay that you know yoko uh. made him money you know, Yoko, like I said before, Yoko was the one that handled all the all the business, right. all the negotiating and, you know, just the money piled up. Yeah. Uh, May could never have played that role for him in his life. Uh, no, not to the extent that Yoko right. did. I right. you know, have no idea what kind of business acumen May Pang has. Right. But, you know, I mean, I've met her, you know several times and you know, she just seems like a nice sweet person and it, it's it's you know not hard to, to understand why john was attracted to her yeah 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 it's it's i guess in a situation like that you know i i know other people that are in situations like that where they've kind of just turned the keys over to their partner in in their in their relationship and sort of in their life as well and once you've done that it's very hard to, you know, to, to walk away from that because you're not just walking away from that individual or that, you know, uh, that person, that relationship. You're walking away from the fact that they control every little aspect of your life, essentially, as well. Um, very much so in, in, in their case, you know, especially when you put in the numero uh, numerology and all that, all those things that were being used to base decisions as well. Um, 
It's very interesting. You you also you also wrote a book about another book which I haven't gotten to yet about pornography. Is is yeah right? that yeah. You know, here that book is called Beaver Street: A History yeah. of Modern Pornography. There it is. Uh, anyway, yeah, let me show and tell. There is the paperback edition of Nowhere Man, and this is my latest book. Bobby in, in Nazi land. It's a memoir about growing up in Brooklyn in the 1950s, 1960s, and it's going to be re-released next year under a different title, a Brooklyn memoir, because you know, th that one came out right before the pandemic started. And, uh, you know, I had been living with the title Bobby in Nazi land for many years. And I think, you know, during the pandemic, the distributor and the publisher just kind of realized that might be too hard. That might be too harsh, but, you know, yes, my second book, Beaver Street, is about the pornography industry. And um, I worked as a magazine editor of uh, men's magazines for 16 years. It was um, a job. And uh, when I finished doing that, you know, after writing the Lennon book, uh, I was, well, OK, what's my next big subject here and uh, pornography that, that at a certain point pornography surpassed rock and roll as America's most lucrative cultural export and it just became this huge business and uh, what I found fascinating about pornography was the constant uh, the constant clash, the um, the interplay between the pornographers and the people who wanted to stop pornography. And <laughs> one of the main themes of the book is that uh, the porno commission, the you know, by declaring war on porn, is the last uh, refuge of the corrupt politician and. Uh, <laughs> Beaver Street is a serious history that reads like a comic novel, and it's a combination of personal memoir, of investigative reporting, and, you know, just straightforward history. And, you know, four of the most corrupt politicians of the 20th century all, de all declared war on pornography. The two best known ones are Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew that they campaigned on, uh, you know, we're going to clean up America and, you know, get rid of all the pornographers. Like, you know, all the, uh, as Nixon told Billy Graham one day, um, as, you know, was recorded on the famous White House taping system, you know, we got to stop the Jewish pornographers. And, uh, they <laughs> and, like, and the other one was uh, Edwin Meese. And the fourth one, I called them, uh, you know, the Fab Four anti-porn warriors. The fourth one was Charles Keating, who was uh, a banker who was in the middle of the savings and loan scandal uh, you know, during the 1980s when, you know, all these retirees, you know, lost their life savings. And, you know, these were all people who declared war on pornography, established porno commissions to investigate pornography. And uh, Nixon and Agnew were, you know, both forced to resign in dis disgrace. Uh, Edwin Meese, who was Ronald Reagan's attorney general, was also forced to resign or face uh, corruption charges, you know, or face prosecution on like all kinds of garden variety corruption. And uh, Charles Keating, the banker behind the savings and loan scandal, actually went to jail for about 12 years. So, um, Damn. you know, these were the great moralists of uh, of the 20th century, and they were just all remarkable hi uh, hypocrites. and. Uh, you know, anytime uh, you hear a politician call out pornography, uh, the first thing that uh, you should do is investigate the politician to see what kind of corruption they're trying to hide. Now, that all changed with 
uh, Donald Trump, who, you know, was <laughs> into porn stars and, you know, had affairs with porn stars and, you know, paid off porn stars to keep quiet and, uh, you know, appeared in like Playboy videos and all this other crap. And, uh, you know, that has really been a sea change is that like, you know, now, uh, you know, pornography is, uh, you know, something that, you know, the right wing is totally fine with as long as Donald Trump is doing it. And, you know, that in a nutshell is uh, a lot of the material that I cover in Beaver Street. Yeah. So I just I was just thinking about I was trying to look look this up, actually, to find out who it was. I just noticed. Uh, do you know what all all fans or for yeah. what is it called? Only fans or what is it called? Yeah. Uh, fans only only fans. You know, I left. The- somebody just tried to ban somebody just basically tried to ban them. Didn't they, they, they basically passed a law that said something about the, they were putting pressure, the financial institutions were putting pressure on them, I think. And, but I think it just got reversed. So I think they're going to continue doing their thing. (laughs) Yeah, that's correct. You said it was called all fans. I'm not even a hundred percent sure what it's called. I know it's oh fans only. I think it's called fans only. And It was porn stars who got this, you know, online thing off the ground. It allowed people, you know, using their computers to interact one on one with porn stars and you'd pay them and, uh, you know, they do what you told them to do. And this became a very lucrative business and they wanted to take it public. And before they took it public, they felt it was best to get rid of the porn stars, you know, even though that was why the business was so lucrative. So they got rid of the porn stars. And then, you know, the other day they changed their minds. They, uh, you know, realized that there could be no fans only without porn stars. Cause that was the only reason anybody knew about fans only or used it. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen now, you know, but I was going to say, too, that I left the porn business in 1999, which is what, 21, 22 years ago. And, you know, I still am in contact with people who I worked with uh, during that time. But it's like, you know, once I got out of it again, you know, I never looked back. It was just like, you know, after working in pornography for 16 years, eight hours a day, five days a week, that for the first five years that I stopped doing it, I, I I could not bear to look at pornography. It was just like, it, it felt like work. I was going to ask, you know, there's, the, because that's one of the arguments that the moralists will, will use is that pornography is terrible for, uh, to, to be exposed to because it desensitizes you to, to, to the act of sex and it gives, you know, uh, unrealistic expectations and it, it, it has long-term health, uh, emotional effects. I mean, as somebody who was uh, exposed to it for, for a good many years, what are, what are your thoughts on that argument yeah, from, I basically from the moralist? <laughs> agree with that, that, you know, my idea of good pornography is a, um, erotica. And, you know, if you, you know, look at what's on, uh, uh, you porn or you know any of these other two channels that the overwhelming majority of what you're seeing has very little to do with pleasure that it just like you know it looks like you know people going through mechanical motions people as machines and you know to find a video where somebody is experiencing genuine pleasure. It's just like, it's hard, so to speak. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, most of, a lot of the, the overwhelming, the overwhelming majority of the pornography out there just seems really schlocky and just kind of ugly to look at. And, um, you know, you're not looking at like, artistic photography of beautiful women and attractive men, you know, coming together and doing their thing. It's just, it's just not like that. You really have to look hard for that. And, uh, uh, you know, kids that, you know, when I was a kid, 
you know, access to pornography was like, you know, pretty much limited to Playboy or something like that. And there's, it's just so easily ex- accessible. And if you're like, you know, 12 years old and looking at a lot of this schlocky crap, uh, you know, it could be traumatizing. It could be mind warping. And I'm not opposed to pornography. I'm opposed to bad pornography. I'm opposed to, uh, you know, these extremely wealthy people who pay people to, you know, just grind out under extreme deadline pressure, you know, just the worst kind of schlocky, ugly pornography. Right. Right. I mean, isn't that kind of a, a risk we run just with the age and our the way we use technology. I mean, obviously it's more accessible because of technology. And, you know, I guess, first of all, I guess some people would argue, and I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here, that, you know, who who is to decide? And I hear this argument when it comes to other subject matter as well. It's like, well, okay, who is to decide what is good porn or good uh, theater or good music or good anything versus what's bad. It's either legal or illegal. And when you've in the age of the internet, it seems like, you know, it's a risk you run because that's a big debate right now. It feels like, because there are some things sort of being censored online and uh, conversations about it. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a current conversation right now. You know, should we censor these things and 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 ban them, or should we, uh, you know, say, hey, look, it's not illegal, and so therefore, you know, the internet's wide open to to everybody. And then does that then maybe put the responsibility back onto parents? Maybe they shouldn't. Maybe a 12 year old shouldn't have a cell phone <laughs> with Internet access. I don't know. You know, it's it's an impossible question. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I'm certainly anti anti censorship. Um, but, yeah, I, I just you know, there's there's no good answer to the question that, you know, the Internet is just this wide open place where there is like all these, you know, dark little corners where people could do whatever the hell they want, you know, certainly kids should not have access to it, but you know, how to regulate it, how to control it. I have, I don't have a clue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a long time before it, before computers were on our phones, it was much easier because I remember as a kid, you know, my, my, my mom, you know, would give me, I, she made me carry a beeper for a while. She made me carry a cell phone, but even that cell phone I had as a kid, it was, you know, just a, a punch phone. All you could really do was punch numbers and dial in into it. You couldn't search the internet. And I feel like that accessibility is what has changed because honestly, if you were back in the day, obviously technology's gotten better and the quality of, of illicit subject matter on the internet has gotten better. But the bottom line is that it's always been available on there. It was just that access was not so readily available to everyone of all ages. And I, I don't know. I mean, it is a difficult question, you know, how to balance, uh, you know, the, I guess, rights of everybody to be on the internet and do what they want to, to do as long as it's not illegal, as opposed to, uh, you know, individually curtailing the access to the internet at an individual level. You know, it's an interesting debate. Yeah, you just summed it up pretty well. And, you know, like I just, you know, there, I don't think there is a good answer. I don't know what the answer is. And I don't think anybody really does. And, you know, just from the dawn of time, it's just been this back and forth between the people who want to stop porn and the people who want to create porn. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it's been around forever. I don't know that you can stop it. I mean, you know, it, 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 that, what do they say about prostitution? It's the oldest profession in the world. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it's the age old question and there ain't no good answer. Yeah. 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 So tell me a little bit about, about your book you've, you've got coming up. It's going to come out for a re release next year, right? Is what? Yeah. Bobby in Nazi land is the current title. It's still, 
available. Um, but it's going to be re retitled as it's going to be retitled on its re-release, right? Brooklyn Memoir, yeah. Brooklyn yeah, Memoir. That, you know, it's a generic title, but um, you know, I was when the when the book came out in 2019. Um, I had before the pandemic hit. I had time to travel around and you know do events in bookstores in various places, and um, people would come up to me after these events, after these readings, and they would say, "I love the book, hated the title." And uh, uh, I was surprised, you know, I thought it was kind of a Mel Brooksian thing that, you know, people would get it as, a, you know, uh, a funny title. And I took dark material. The book is about growing up in Brooklyn, post-World War II era, 1950s, early 1960s, uh, you know, pretty much from the final days of the Brooklyn Dodgers to the coming of the Beatles. And... Uh, uh, it is it, what I describe in what I think is a darkly humorous way. It's it's black humor is a child's consciousness developing as he learns about what happened during World War Two, the Holocaust, and that I grew up in a neighborhood, Flappish in Brooklyn, where for whatever reason, a lot of Holocaust survivors move there and, you know, you just see the numbers on people's arms and, you know, they were all over the place. And, uh, you know, it explores that. And, you know, it just, uh, that, you know, a child coming to understand what happens and the effect that that has on people that, you know, my father was uh, a World War II veteran who liberated uh, a concentration camp and uh, he never really talked about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that the child sets out, you know, the child, me, the narrator, that it's like what the narrator does. The book is narrated in the first person. It's a memoir and it filters a child's thoughts and emotions through um, an adult consciousness. And yeah, he uh, it's just, you know, everything that's going on and at the time and, you know, just the way that World War II hung over the neighborhood, hung over the, the entire borough, like a mass hallucination, like the war never ended. And uh does it does not, it's not sounding very funny to me, <laughs> right? That, you know, that if, uh, that, you know, I mean, I can read you like uh, the opening paragraph of of the book. You know, it's called the first chapter is called the Goyim and the Jews. And you know, if you don't know what Goyim means, you know, if you're not one, you're the other. You're either a Goyim or a Jew. A Goyim yeah. is like everybody who's not a Jew. And I'll just read the first paragraph. So first of all, I didn't call them Goyim. My parents and grandparents called them goyim. I knew what the word meant. I knew hundreds of Yiddish words, maybe a thousand. I just, I just never used them because they sounded too Jewish. Yiddish was the language old Jews spoke when they didn't want young Jews to understand what they were saying. So I didn't call the goyim anything, even though our building was full of them. And, you know, that's kind of the tone of the book. And it goes on like that for uh, you know, 60,000 words or so. And... The point that I make is that the Holocaust, the war, that, you know, people went through that, they lived through it. They, um, you know, came back from Europe, you know, either as people who lived there and people who fought there. And what the effect that it seemed to have was that it filled them with hatred and prejudice. Mm. And... Um, yeah, I get into the book how how my father, who I said, you know, liberated a concentration camp, and a lot of people in my family were overt racists. And, you know, you just grew up, you know, hearing all about the N-word and a point I make at uh, in the the uh, the afterword of the book is that Donald Trump 
grew up in the adjoining borough, Queens, a couple of miles from where I grew up. And, mm. you know, he was exposed to the same kind of thing, the same racism, the, the same hatred. Uh, I somehow was able to transcend it and, you know, learn that there was another way to be, another way to live, another way to feel, another way to understand people who are different than you. Uh, Trump understood it perfectly well too, but he understood it so well that he was able to exploit the hatred that lurked just below the surface and mm. exploit it to the extent that he was able to ride it to the, to the presidency. And, uh, well, I, I think too, that you had that in that people as individuals, when they encounter those situations, whether it's family, whether it's associates, friends, or just people you happen to be around at the time when those Im improper and racist kind of comments or jokes are, are made, uh, you know, you, you, you learn from them in one of two ways for, well, maybe more than that, but I gen generally think about it in, in the, in one of two ways. And that is you recognize the, like you said, from Trump's perspective, where you can, can harness it for, for evil <laughs> or, or not positive things. I shouldn't say evil, but not positive things. I don't want to be hyperbolic, but, um, or you realize that, you know, you kind of say to yourself, you know, what that guy or what that person just said is kind of messed up. Uh, that doesn't seem right at all. And and then as you as you maybe get older, you you know, you start speaking speaking up about it, and you know, saying saying it's you know, let, letting people know that that's not the <laughs> not the way to be. Conversely, you know, I've I've also you know from from myself been in situations where as a kid where, you know, you, you maybe couldn't say, say anything, you know, because you yourself were in somewhat of a, of a precarious, uh, situation <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, you know, like I said, I was surrounded by it. I heard virtually everybody talked that way. I lived in a neighborhood that was, nearly a hundred percent white. This was Brooklyn. This was Flatbush. And, you know, it was a hundred percent white because of, of redlining, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And there's this picture that was taken in October, 1964, right before uh, the presidential election that year. And one of the main commercial streets in Flatbush, Church Avenue, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, who was running for president, and uh, Robert Kennedy came down the street in an open limousine, which was like strange enough considering what yeah. had happened uh, a year before. But and there's this enormous crowd on on both sides of Church Avenue, and every single face in the crowd is white. There is not one black person to be seen in that whole crowd. So what I'm saying is that I was, you know, even though it was the North, even though it was like, you know, liberal, you know, New York City, New York City was really not so liberal, especially in the outer boroughs. And uh, uh, that you're just swimming in this sea of racism and what, like, you know, you're seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And like, you know, people talk that way. Everybody uses the N word. Uh, you know, you, you hear it in school, you hear it at home. My father owned a candy store around the corner. You go into the candy store, you hear it there. And <laughs> you know, like I said, I didn't know there was another way to be. And, you know, I told the racist jokes too. When I was you know, 10 years old, I told racist jokes because everybody told racist, mm. you know, jokes, but you know, at a, a certain point, my consciousness developed and my consciousness was raised to, you know, use the, um, the current term. I was woke and <laughs> you know, that really happened 
to some degree towards the end of high school. But, you know, mostly it happened. I went to college in Harlem, the City College of New York. That's in Harlem. And, you know, I just I met a completely different kind of people there, you know, people who were um, you know, not racist. You know, people who were, you know, left leaning politically, uh, you know, who were in, involved with the you know, student left and the peace movement and all that. And. Uh, I changed and, yeah. you know, I outgrew my roots and, yeah. um, you know, I'm a very different person now at the you know incredibly advanced age of 69 years old, which I can hardly <laughs> believe that's how old I am, but I am that old. And, you know, I'm just a different person now than I was when I was, you know, 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. It's, it's always a journey of, of evolving through life and uh, perspective changing. And I think you touch on something that's really important, you know, for, for, for my perspective is simply exposing yourself to other people, to people from different backgrounds, to people from other cultures, to people from other belief systems, and just be willing to have, you know, you don't have to change your mind and believe what they do, but, you know, at least be willing to have conversations with individuals. And, and I think that over time in and of itself starts to evolve your, your consciousness and your mind to where, you know, it's it's hard to understand how much we all have in common or to put yourself in someone else's shoes if you don't know anybody else that's not different than you. It, it, it's very difficult and it's very strange because as connected as we all are on the Internet now today, it almost feels like, you know, we're actually more separated and divided because of how ac accessible we all are to one another in a way. Yeah, well, one thing that the John Lennon book did when that came out 21 years ago was it opened doors for me all over the world because, you know, part of the, of the reason was because it was translated into, into different languages. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it gave me the opportunity to like, you know, travel you know, through Europe, through Latin America, through South America, uh, and, you know, just meet all these different kinds of people. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I had never traveled more like the first 12 years of my life, <laughs> I'd never traveled more than a hundred miles from home. I got as far as Poughkeepsie once. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that I think in, uh, you know, when I was about 12 years old, I made it to Washington DC with my parents and, you know, but, you know, to travel, you know, through third world countries and, you know, be embraced by the people there because of, uh, a, a book I'd written and like, you know, that the, the you know, these people in Chile and Argentina and Mexico, they want to talk about John Lennon and they want to talk about peace and they want to talk about politics that it was just, you know, it was really mind expanding. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, even myself, you know, traveling is one of the best things, you know, even if you don't live in a big city or you don't live in a place where there's a lot of different cultures that have come together where you can experience it like obviously LA and New York are, are definitely that way. You know, if you live in a smaller town, there's not a lot of diversity, do some traveling. It will, it really will change your perspective on the world, on life. You, 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 and, and I always encourage people because it's something I like to do. And obviously you have to be careful, but you know, don't just stick to the touristy spots and the tourist areas. Like, go talk to somebody at the local restaurant, at the local mom and pop, their version of a mom and pop restaurant, and, you know, have conversations with people. And you really start to realize that, you know, yeah, there's cultural differences, but we're all kind of worried about the same exact things. And it just, it, it just really changes your perspective on, on the world and, and, our relationship yeah. to one another. You got to reach out. You got to talk to people. What you were just saying about a big city that, you know, yeah, obviously uh, New York is a, a big city, but at the time, 1950s, 1960s, early 1960s, early 1960s, that flappish really was 
like a small town and it was like, you know, probably 99.9% white. And then because all the Catholic kids went to parochial school that the, 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 the public school I went to was not only like 99.9% you know, white, but also 99.9% Jewish. And it mm. was just like, so homogenized that, you know, you just kind of lose perspective on what else is out there. Yeah. And you I think, mean, you know, everything's like that. Yeah. I mean, obviously I've, I've been to New York a couple times, to- a few times. Um, and I've, I've, I've lived here in LA for just a few years. So I, you know, obviously I, I don't, haven't experienced its full evolution as a city. But even here, you know, when I say there's all these different cultures, you know, in in LA, it's it, it, they're still broken up into different sections. There's Koreatown and Chinatown and Little Tokyo. And in my visits to New York, I feel like it's even more that way as far as like, because here in LA, at least people drive. A lot of people in New York and especially over, you know, back a few decades, there definitely wasn't a lot of driving and transportation necessarily wasn't great. And so I feel like when people were in their neighborhoods or in their boroughs, they probably I mean, there was probably good reason that they felt, you know, in the in that bubble and and they didn't travel that much outside of it, I would imagine. Is that fairly accurate to say? Well, no, I didn't really know people who traveled, my parents didn't travel. You know, like I said, that first 12 years of my life, I, you know, got to Washington DC once, which was, you know, 250 miles away. And other than that, I got as far as Poughkeepsie. But, but was there a lot of travel? Did people typically travel from like Flatbush to a different borough or to Manhattan oh, yeah. or to different parts of the city. Was that was that kind of mixture common or did people kind of stay in Flatbush or stay? No, in- no, that that things were a lot safer then. And by the time I was, you know, you know, 10, 11 years old, I would take the subway into Manhattan with my oh, friends. Wow. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure that that does not happen anymore. <laughs> you know, you don't see, you know, 10 year old <laughs> kids traveling by themselves on, on the subway. Uh, but, you know, it was a, a lot more wide open and, you know, still that, you know, even when I travel to Manhattan by myself, I mean, you know, I would stay in the tourist places. I would, you know, maybe mm-hmm. go to Radio City or something like that. You know, I didn't, sure. you know, hang around in the village with the Bohemians. <laughs> well, you're a kid. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> hang out in Washington Square Park. Uh you know, that yeah. that would have been more interesting, but it never occurred to me to do that, that, you know, that I would go there. I would you know that I remember going to Radio City or going to a museum or something like that. It was all, you know, very uh, um, limited into how much I was roaming around on my own. Yeah. And but it, we did travel, but virtually, you know, nobody traveled far that mm. I remember in my sixth grade class, there was one kid who went to Europe for the summer. And that was like, unbelievable. <laughs> that uh, you know, I, I did not know anybody who did that. Uh, I had, it's, it's still unbelievable to me to be able to go for a whole summer. <laughs> yeah. 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 And like, you know, he came back and he would tell us stories about the mountains in Switzerland and things like that. It just seemed fantastic. And I had this, um, my mother's brother, my uncle, uh, he was a salesman. I write about him in, in, in Bobby in, in Nazi land. And, uh, he was a salesman. He made a lot of money selling women's clothing, coats, and things like that. That I think in like the mid 1960s, he was making 500 bucks a week, which was like a fortune then. Yeah. And he would travel and you know, he would go to Europe and he would go to the Caribbean and he would go to Las Vegas for the weekend and things like that. And, you know, he bought uh, a Cadillac and he bought an MG sports car. And what he showed me was that, you know, it was possible to escape from that kind of life that, you know, there was more out there. And, um, you know, I didn't really want to be uh, a salesman, but, you know, I knew that, you know, if he can make it out, I can make it out. 
And, uh, you know, eventually I did. I moved to Manhattan in 1975. And for the most part, I have been here ever since that. I tried Los Angeles once that many years ago, 1980, <laughs> I was uh, invited out to Los Angeles to try out as a writer for the for the uh, for the, the Friday show, which was the uh, L.A. version of Saturday Night Live. Do you remember that? The Friday show? I, I don't. On for like two seasons yeah, around 1980. No. Are you old enough to remember that? Probably not. Um, you, you, not, not quite old enough. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I was uh, a young and upcoming writer at the time. And uh, I spent several months, you know, living in LA, trying to break into comedy writing, trying to break into TV. I lived in the, in the, uh, the Montecito hotel on Franklin Avenue, which I think is, uh, it's like an old age home now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the building, but I know where, where Franklin and I know where that's over. I know where that's at. Yeah. yeah. It's on Franklin between Las Palmas and, Ch and, and Cherokee. And I lived there for like, you know, for like six months. And, um, I, you know, that was about all the LA that I could take. <laughs> yeah, LA's a LA's a different uh it's a different beast for sure. It's 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 its own challenge, own unique challenge, yeah. that's for certain. No, the last time I was out there, the driving and the traffic was just it was insane that it took like, you know, hours to get from from Santa Monica to West Hollywood. I think it was like a two hour drive stuck, you know, it's just stuck in traffic and, uh, and there's no place to park there now. It's all like, you know, permit parking or something. And, you know, they're like, you know, looming over you waiting to tow your car away and give you a, a, a ticket. And, uh, well, anyway, that was LA and I tried that and I lived in Washington DC for a while too, in 1975 that believe it or not, I was once a speechwriter for the secretary of the air force. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, um, a job that, you know, could have taken me in a very different direction from like, uh, you know, writing about pornography and writing about John Lennon. And, uh, so this was prior to the books. Yeah, this was 1975. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, what that job was about was writing speeches to, um, mm. ask Congress for more money to build more weapons. And, wow. uh, you know, like the main theme of all the speeches was that nuclear weapons are not for killing people. They are to deter killing. And the more nuclear weapons there are, the more deterrence there is. And you also need the right size weapon to do the job. You can't be stomping ants with elephants. So uh, yeah, that, that was the way they talked there, stomping ants with elephants. And, you know, what they meant was like you couldn't have these like, you know, huge megaton hydrogen bombs you also needed small tactical uh, nuclear weapons course. and you needed <laughs> neutron bombs and you know all that other fine stuff and i was just you know not going to devote my life to um you know promoting nuclear warfare and uh i left washington and you know came back to new york yeah i, I don't i don't blame you i uh they've they've found plenty of other people to write those letters clearly they've they've kept the uh the military industrial complex rolling right along over the years, uh, which we'll, we'll see if that continues or not. But um, yeah, well, I want to be, I want to be cautious of your time. I know, I know we're, 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 no, that uh, was my cat just trying to walk in front of the camera. So. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I think, I think for a lot of people, you know, if you, if you're in a situation where you're, you don't know what to do, you know, I've, it's definitely possible, you know, if you don't have a lot of money or whatever, you don't have to be rich to travel. You can be strategic and with your career path. And, uh, you know, you can you can expose yourself to a lot that way if you're thoughtful about it. So, you know, that's that's uh, that would be my my little tidbit of 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 thought to to individuals out there looking to broaden their horizons from wherever they're currently yeah, at. The book I'm, I'm working on now, which is not titled yet. I don't know what the title is going to be, but it takes place during the 1970s. And uh, a lot of it is set in the, uh, the underground press, but there's a section where speaking of travel and speaking of not having money to travel, 
uh, <laughs> I did a lot of hitchhiking that all oh. through the 1970s, I hitchhiked all over the US, you know, New York to San Francisco. I hitchhiked to Canada. I hitchhiked through Western Europe and Israel. And uh, uh, I'm wow. just like, you know, working now on, on, on trying to put across the experience of what it's like to put on probably 25,000 miles, you know, hitchhiking. And, uh, you know, again, that's something that sane people don't do anymore. Yeah, I mean, I started to say you've. There's got to be some amazing stories and individuals that you met in in those travels, hitchhiking, you know. And I, as you were saying it, I was like, yeah, I, you know, it seems terrifying to hitchhike today. But at the same time, I also sometimes wonder, just because we know about all the, I feel like we know more about all the bad things that happen in the world today. And, you know, in the 70s, maybe there was the same bad stuff as much bad stuff happening. We just didn't know about it. So we didn't think it was as bad. That's, you know, I'm always kind of torn on that dilemma. But uh, I certainly don't know anybody that does much hitchhiking these days. <laughs> uh, me neither. You know, I have not stuck out my thumb at this point in many decades. But, you know, when I started working on this this book I was just talking about, the untitled one about the 1970s, I started keeping journals for the first time on these hitchhiking trips, and I was looking through the journal I kept in 1974 when I hitchhiked from New York to California. And at that point, I was just like really into keeping the journal, getting down every detail, every day, every ride, everything that happened. And looking at it for the first time in 40 some odd years, I scared myself. It's like, no, don't get into that car. You know, <laughs> no, and like what, what reading that journal made me feel after 47 years was that I don't believe I'm alive. <laughs> This is the an alternate reality. <laughs> I, you know, obviously uh, I survived, but you know, I took chances. I took, you know, just chances without realizing you were taking chances. I was like, you know, 20, 21 years old, 19 years old, you know, that uh, and, you know, now you were, just kind of naive you, and you, you got very, the optimism of youth and you, you feel, very, you know, invulnerable and indestructible. Were you very, were you physically imposing as a strapping 21 year old? No, I was never really physically imposing. I was uh, like, you know, five, eight, uh, you know, 140 pounds at the time. Yeah. So, 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 so you're saying, so you're saying you probably got into a few cars that were, uh, very qu questionable as you, as you read it now. That, yeah. You know, if I had any sense whatsoever, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Ah, uh, youth. But, you know, you, in, in retrospect, you know, like you said, you're, you're here and it, it came out. So, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I you know, can't ju judge a book by its cover, I guess, is the lesson there. But still, it's good to be careful. <laughs> I don't want to don't want to encourage anybody to do this today by any no, means. No, but no, but, no. but uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 interesting because we do oftentimes have all those little warning signs go off when we're in those situations. And you know, the danger alert, it's that, you know, fight or flight kind of kind of intuition starts to kick in. But, off, you know, a lot of times in today's world, we don't have a lot of real reason for those things to go off because we're not being hunted by tigers and lions and bears and, and everything else. We're, we create a lot of those situations. But I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to kind of circle back on is just, you know, so, some of sometimes it's, uh, they're false alarms. You know, we, we, we see things that maybe are, are there and we get lucky, but other times I think maybe we, we see things that uh, we impose upon the situation as well. Um, just from previous experiences and so forth. That makes sense to me. Well, either way, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you survived and I'm, I'm kind of interesting because I'm very interested in, in this book and, and when it comes out, because like, uh, many years ago, I was into uh, Jack Kerouac and, uh, you know, so, some of the some of those uh, types of uh, beatnik, you know, uh, hitchhiking kind of stories and traveling stories. And so I think this will be a very interesting read, you know, uh, from from you as well. 
Yeah, well, speaking of Kerouac, you know, of course, I read Kerouac when I was like 18 years old for the first time. And, oh, I want to do that. You know, I want the <laughs> kicks. I want the experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I did that especially the New York to San Francisco one that was inspired by Kerouac. And, mm. you know, when I started working on the hitchhiking portion of the book that I'm doing now, uh, I said, you know, let me reread Kerouac. So I read him when I was 18. I re- and I'm rereading him, you know, all these years later, 50 years later. And my impression of the book 50 years after the fact was, Jesus, those guys are fucked up. <laughs> it's it's so interesting because I can remember right, you know, thinking back on it now, reading it, it it made me also, it gave me this this thing where I had this in my mind. I never acted on it, obviously, but like it made you want to go hit the road. It made you want to be free and and not do it. And that's that's interesting that you say that now. When you reread it, you're like, eh, that is that really what I would have wanted to do and and have a life like that. Time gives interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, perspective. Yes. Yeah. yeah. At this age, I mean, you know, like I said. I recently turned 69, actually exactly one month ago, I turned 69 and, you know, it's, it's a shock to be this old. I mean, you know, in my head, I don't feel 69, you know, in my head, there's still that, you know, 19, 20 year old who, uh, you know, got into the wrong cars. And, um, but, you know, it does give you perspective and, uh, You know, if you're lucky, you know, you live this long and you might even accumulate some wisdom. And I hope I did. (laughs) Wisdom is something uh, desperately needed in these days. So, uh, yeah, it's good advice. Well, we're we're, we're, so you've got. So tell everybody where let's go over your books again. Tell everybody where they can get your books. And okay. when uh, is the expected date on this untitled hitchhiking book? Because I'm interested in that. <laughs> I don't know. You know, okay. that uh, I'm just, you know, doing it on my own. You know, these uh, days I'm a full time writer. So you're, you're 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 literally writing it as right now. Yeah. Uh, I go. I got you. I got you. You know, before coming on here, I was, you know, working on the book. I do it every day, seven days a week. That's the way the books uh, get written that yeah. I've never had a deal until I've actually finished the book, but you know, I finished the book and then I start looking for the deal. That's the way I've, I've worked my whole career as a writer of, of books, but no. you know, I've got three books out, uh, nowhere, man, the final days of John Lennon, Beaver street, a history of modern pornography and Bobby in in Nazi land, a tale of flappish coming out retitled next year as a Brooklyn memoir. My life is a boy. Um, they're available all the places that you would look for books on, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, you know, every other place. Uh, they're available in paperback and ebook, uh, not audio book, unfortunately. Um, and you could order them through, you know, your brick and mortar bookstore or just like, you know, get them on Amazon. That's the easiest way. You know, any online bookseller will have them. Uh, Anything you want to know about me or my books, if you want to communicate with me directly, the best thing to do is to go to my website, which is robertrosennyc.com. So my name followed by uh, nyc.com. It's got you know, links to, uh, you know, all the different places, to, you know, to, to buy and to download my books and, uh, you know, anything that you want to know about me. And uh, I am always happy to receive email from readers. And, um, you know, I got, you know, it links to my Facebook page, my Twitter account, um, my Instagram account, and, uh, you know, just all the stuff that everybody does to put themselves out there. I do it too. And I'm always happy to hear from readers. Awesome. I know I, I, before I let you go, I do have one more, one more question that you kind of struck me there when you said you sit down and you write seven days a week and that's how it gets done. So are you, uh, more of a, a methodical, like 
writer in that you're it's like it's like a job you you, you kind of allot the time and you sit down and you put in the time and you just do it every day like a job or do you when inspiration is striking you 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 might write for three days at uh you know 16 hours a day and just and, and then not work for a few days no i do it like a job, I, you know, mm. I sit down, you know, not at a particular time, but, you know, I will sit down at some point during the day, you know, usually, you know, sometimes in the morning, usually by the afternoon, if things are going extremely well, which happens sometimes, I'll work, you know, into the evening, but I will put in a couple of hours every day. And, you know, I don't mean hours staring at the computer. I mean, you know, hours, you know, actually, you know, editing <laughs> or writing or just, uh, you know, promoting that you know, it's a job. And, you know, if you wait for inspiration, it's not going to get done. Mm. That's that's good advice. That right there is one to close on. If you wait for inspiration, you won't get it done. I like that. I'm a big believer in putting in the hard work, so I love that. That's a good way to end. Well, thank you again for for being on here uh, and chatting with me. Uh, it's been a really fascinating conversation. I'm excited uh, to 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 read your other books that I haven't gotten to yet. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for whenever uh, whenever your your one you're working on now comes out you know, feel free to reach back out and let's, uh, we'll chat about that one as well. Yeah. It's been uh, a pleasure, Matthew. It's been an interesting Friday evening here in New York city. <laughs> and, uh, when you, you get around to Bobby in Nazi land, be prepared to laugh out loud, you know, even though it didn't sound funny. Uh, you know, it's one thing people have told me about my books, all three of them is that it's not what they expected. And it's you know, not. it, it, it it takes them by surprise. And, you know, that's uh, a good thing. And, you know, they're all funny. And, uh, you know, I'm a humorist. You know, like I said, I was in Los Angeles trying to uh, get a job as a comedy writer. And, you know, in my books, I take the comedy, I take the journalism, the memoir, the history, and it just, you know, kind of all comes together into this, uh, in, into this, this book. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, thanks for having me on and I hope you enjoy my books. Yes, sir. Certainly will. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.